I'm officially resigning from love. Time in a cell will do that to a kid. For the record, I didn't do it. Well, I didn't mean for everything to blow up in my face. This was supposed to be the best night of my life. I was gonna save the town, get the girl, make our widow proud. Instead, I'm locked in a cell that smells like chorizo and stale popcorn. While my arch nemesis continues to brainwash the community with reggaeton and free sunscreen. I'm sitting on a cracked vinyl sofa while I await my sentence. The only thing I learned in these last crazy couple of weeks is that no matter how much we try to believe that David beat Goliath, the reality is the big guy always wins. Even if that big guy is actually a 5'2 land developer with stupendously gelled hair. <laughs> my little slingshot didn't even bruise his forehead. The other thing I learned is that love is like a giant pretzel. It's, it's twisty and salty. And it leaves your mouth dry and thirsty. So let me start the puro desastre, the like total epic meltdown from the beginning. Three Sundays ago at my abuela's restaurant, La Cocina de la Isla. So that's the start of the epic fail of Arturo Zamora. That's right, you can clap. That's right. <laughs> Talks. Uh, actually, hold on. All right, so look, real talk now for a minute. My mom, when I go speak at a university, she always tells me, you have to wear a jacket <laughs> when you're speaking at a university. And she legit FaceTimes me before I do my talk to make sure that I'm wearing my jacket. Y'all see my jacket? You see it? Legit? Okay. <laughs> I was like, yes, mommy, I'm, 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 I'm fine. I'm going to wear the jacket. I'm going to wear the jacket. Okay, let me see. Let me see. Okay, that's very cute. I like it. All right, I like what you did with your hair and this and that. I'm like, all right, cool. We good now? We're good. Yes. So I come here, wear the jacket. Yeah, no mas. <laughs> it's too long. I took too long in this journey. I wore jackets for so long. I'm done with the jackets. I give that talk. Um, I always start like that when I get talks around the country, mostly to, to young people. And I love that beginning. And I usually, I usually go and, and start telling about what the themes of the book are and how they are referenced with this intro. You know, we have educators in the house, right? Yeah, the, the, pretty much all of you are educators. <laughs> uh, and it's cool, because I say, okay, so what are the themes of this book? And I, and usually, uh, I tell them, all right, so tell your teachers that the themes of Pomegranatized books are three things. Family, community, and culture. And occasional awkward romance. Because that's what I was when I was 13. I was super awkward. But I want to talk a little bit about what that means. About how I came to understanding that part of my artistic journey, that claim to the type of writing that I do, family, culture, community. It's interesting because, you know, when I travel around, I love, I love going to communities, you know, because I get to sort of explore the different places and the different people. So I've never been to Salt Lake. And when I, when I got here, it was interesting because we're talking about family, culture, community. I started thinking about what I was going to say, what I was going to talk about. And as I got to Salt Lake, I realized there was something else that I wanted to, to speak about. Perception. Right? I tell people, I'm going to Salt Lake. Oh. <laughs> oh. A friend of mine legit said, I don't think you can drink there. <laughs> As if that's why I was going. You know, yeah, I'm gonna go to Salt Lake for the weekend to have some drinks at the bar. <laughs> On 9th, this 9th Street, right? Is that the micro right? Nice. The place where the spots are. I went to a restaurant that was delicious yesterday. It's a Mediterranean, or Moroccan place. Is it Moroccan? 
Masa? Masa. It's delicious. So good. But it's funny because it's these perceptions, right? Or misperceptions. So you come to Salt Lake and I was like, what is, what am I going to expect here? Right? I did Google, by the way, it says, is, is Salt Lake City dry? <laughs> Just curious, not that I want to drink or anything. <coughs> but interestingly, and then I, I get picked up by Lauren and this. And it was just, it was wonderful because immediately, immediately any misconception is erased. Just in a car ride, heading over, and then meeting some people, right? Engaging with some people. I did learn something, too. Apparently, in Salt Lake, everybody is in everybody's business. <laughs> this is what I, so it was really interesting. So we're eating, we're eating uh, dinner, right? And we're talking about, about the, about Read You, and we're talking, you know, about, about cultural things. And then all of a sudden the server goes, are you guys from the Spanish language department at the university? I couldn't help but overhearing you. <laughs> it happened like three times. They were like, there was, there was a person next to us. You go, are you guys teachers? So am I. <laughs> it's just this community thing. There's like five different tables. I'm like, oh my god, I know you. It was so cool. My mom would fit right in. My mom is like, she wants to be friends with everybody. <laughs> of course, me, I'm a New Yorker. I'm like, why are we talking to? <laughs> but it's cool, you know. And there's these these misperceptions that we put on other people other things, other places that we don't know. And I was thinking about this as I was, I was preparing my talk and I, and I thought, this is an important thing to talk about because it's very relevant to even my own story. Misperception. So if you were to examine my life as an artist, it's a tale of two halves. And since I'm in like a March Madness state of mind, I really wanted to separate my life in two halves, two 20 minute halves. I grew up in New York and I, I was really, I was really well uh, adjusted to being a kid who, who was, you know, had a loving family. I went to a, an international school where there were lots of different cultures, lots of different languages being spoken. My father would tell me about Cuba, where he is from, where he was born, and Cuba, how it, it seemed like, like the streets were paved with gold. And everything was perfect, it was really nice. And I met, um, I met a lot of friends and I had a teacher. I had a teacher in fourth grade, this is me. And all of your teachers, so I want to tell this story about Mrs. Mead. Mrs. Mead was awesome. And she is the one that first introduced me to a love of reading. She gave me an access point to read. I loved, I loved Mrs. Mead because she put a book in front of me. And I picked it up and I read it. And the first book that I ever read from cover to cover was the BFG by Roll. People ask, oh, what's the first book you read? And I always find it really interesting when people say, what's the first book you read? And you, an author will tell you, well, it was Dostoevsky's, you know, Notes from the Underground. No, it was not. No, it wasn't. It was a children's book. Tell me. That's an awesome part. No, mine was BFT, Roald Dahl, and I loved it. I loved the language of it. I loved using frog scuttle. And, and, and all the really great characters and the way that, that the story could make sense out of seemingly senseless words. I loved it. Mrs. Mead saw that excitement in it. She saw, being a great educator that she was, she saw it. She said, you know what? I'm going to give him another book. And she gave me Jules Verne, Journey to the Center of the Earth. And I read that, and I fell in love with it. And then my imagination started sparking, and I, and I asked her, Mrs. Mead, can I write a story like that? And she said, yes. Go for it. Well, how do I write it? And she said, just think of whatever it is you want to write. She didn't set parameters. She didn't set boundaries for me. She just said, go. And I did it. And I created characters. I ended up using my name, but reversed it, Oblap. 
<laughs> but then, like, my heightened sense of confidence was Oblap, savior of the known universe. <laughs> my brother Danny, I called him Mean Dad. <laughs> Oblap's faithful ferret. <laughs> there was Ginny the Terrible. And Ginny was literally a girl in my fourth grade class, and she was terrible. <laughs> But I had this, this sort of creative explosion, and I just wanted to write. I even got so far as to recreating scenes from the books that I loved. I recreated the scene from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in my bathtub, <laughs> where I put one of those little boards in my tub. I filled the tub up, and I had my little brother on top of the tub, on top of the little board, and I went under it. And I was the giant squid going like this, like this, and, and Captain Nemo was like, oh no, no. So I and I was I threw Danny, my brother, over the bathtub, and the water just cascades over the tub, right, as my mother is walking in. She's like, what are you doing? It's a book, Mom! <laughs> I had that sort of creative. Um, creative outlet that Mrs. Mead endeavored me to have. She gave me that freedom, and it was really cool. And as I was growing up, I felt this sort of connection to creativity and to the, the idea that I could create and I could be anything. It was awesome. It was awesome. Recently, my mother gave me, for Christmas, she gave me a a frame, and that frame was a poem that Mrs. Mead wrote to me, and I'm going to share that with you, because it really shows a lot about the power that a teacher can have on a child. It shows a lot about, I have like pictures of my life, my daughter. <laughs> and I thought it was here, but now it's not. Where is it? I'll find it. I'll find it and I'll get back to you because I, I thought I had it here and I don't. Here it is. Yes! Okay. So it's it's a frame. I don't know if you can't really see it. It's a frame, and in, in this picture, and my mom recently gave this to me, and it says to Pablo, the little boy, bright eyed. Hollis stood there, poem in hand, waiting for approval, an easy task. Time passed, he grew taller, a little wiser, heart in hand, he asked questions which had no answers. The boy is nearly man now, <coughs> the eyes still bright, the polish is inside now, and the poem in hand is mine. With love, this is me. She wrote this to me when I was in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. And it really touched, you know, touched me. I want to talk about the other half of my story. Because this seemingly great childhood, this seemingly wonderful teacher who was kind to me. There are also parts of our stories that sometimes are not as kind. And there are people who are not as generous with, with the way that they are with people, especially young people. So I was 20 years old. And I I decided to move to LA to pursue a career in acting. Because, you know, I was going to be the Cuban Matt Damon. <laughs> I was. <coughs> this was right around the time of Good Will Hunting. And my friend and I, my friend Brandon and I, who was also Cuban American, he was like, let's just do it. We're going to write a script. We're going to go to LA. We're going to make it. Yes. And very quickly, I started working. I started working, I was the sexy Latino uh, in, in a show. I was the, uh, I was
was Ricky Martin's body double. I was on a shaky bomb bomb. <laughs> I was doing well. I was I was in a show called Will and Grace, where I played Jack's boyfriend, Fernando. <laughs> it was good. I was like, yeah, this is what we're doing. I have done it. I have had a charmed life. Here I go. It's awesome. And one day, I go in front of this cast director, and I'll never forget because the, the show that I was, uh, it was a, a lifetime movie that I was auditioning for, and I went before this casting director, and I auditioned, and it was a, uh, one of these like, like survival, like a, there was a pilot, and he crashes into a snow-covered mountain, and he's like, has to walk out and like, journey through down the mountain without like, eating himself and stuff, and I, and I did this scene, and it was like, you know, I finished, and I was like, shot. And I finished it. And the, and, and the casting director said, that was really good. Really good. I was like, thank you. I felt, good. I felt really good. He goes, yeah. And he looks at my headshot. And he goes, yeah. Huh. I just, I'm just curious. Can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, sure. Why, why do you keep calling yourself Pablo? What? Well, it's my name. I said, I'm not Mexican. I'm, I'm Cuban American. Here I was. I've never not considered myself Cuban American up to that point. I was like, I'm, I'm Cuban American. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not black enough to be a Cuban. Okay. And he's telling me this, looking at my headshot, and I'm, I'm kind of feeling sort of uncomfortable and, and, and unsure of myself. And I said, well, I, I, I don't know. I mean, that's just me. He goes, you know what you should do? As if he was offering me the greatest advice that had ever been given to anybody. He said, you know what you should do? You should, you should change your name. You should change your name because I'm gonna tell you what, you're gonna work a lot more. You're gonna work a lot more. You should blend, blend a little bit. You know, like be a little more generic. The roles are gonna be so much more for you. Gives me my headshot back, I take it. Okay, 20 years old. Walk outside. It's the first time that I felt like slapped, but I didn't say anything to it. And I, and I went outside and I thought about it. I was like, well, maybe I should. Should I do this? Should I change my name? Should I, like, I don't, what? What should I do? So what I ended up deciding was yes, yes, I am an artist. I am an actor, and and I do, and I want to work. And what I did was I did. I changed my name. I changed my name. And here's the, the sad part. I worked more. I worked more. Because I was a generic, maybe Latino, maybe Italian. Maybe he's Egyptian. Maybe he's, who knows? He's just blended. Non-specific. I went home to visit my family in Miami. And when I was home, my dad gets hold of my headshot. My dad gets hold of my headshot, and he does one of those things that parents do when they're upset, but they don't say anything. He looks and he says, when? Okay. My headshot with my new name on it, he just says, okay. And it was the first time that like, I feel like my dad was disappointed in me, but like on a different level. And I didn't understand why, so I asked my mom. And I said, Mommy, why is Poppy so upset? And then she tells me the story. But she doesn't tell me the story of Cuba and its golden era. She doesn't tell me the story of, of, of the snow-covered mountains in Cuba and all these beautiful things that happened. No, she tells me the story of my father being a political prisoner in Cuba. She tells me the story of my father being in a prison for two years, sleeping on a hardwood floor, on a, on a concrete floor, eating raw macaroni, sharing one bathroom with 500 men, having his teeth pulled out without any kind of anesthesia, basically being starved, watching his friends being thrown into a pool of excrement while they were trying to keep themselves floating up and they would throw sticks at them. Like, like hit them with sticks. And he watched his friends, one of his friends lost all 
motor functions over the side of his face. My mother tells me the story. She tells me the story and she says, when your father was released, he was barely recognizable. He was gaunt, he couldn't walk, they had to carry him onto the plane, and when he was sent to the United States, he left his family behind. He left his beloved grandfather. Now I'll give you one guess what his grandfather's name was. Bob. There's a moment in our stories, in our histories, right, that we contend with the past, that we are faced with a reckoning of our past. And this was my reckoning. This was my awakening of the realities. And I was very confused, and I was sad, and I was angry, and then I started thinking. And then I started thinking about every single moment in my life. I rewind the second half of my story. I rewind back to being five years old. Y la primera idioma que yo aprendí fue español. Y no me di cuenta que yo no hablé inglés hasta que tenía cinco años cuando entré en el colegio. When I entered school, that was the first time that I spoke English. You know why? I start realizing this as I'm retracing back. Do you know why? Because the teacher said we don't have that language here. We don't speak Spanish here. We speak English. And then I remember taking attendance in class, and then who are you? Oh, I'm Pablo. Pablo like Paul? No? And then I remember going through, going through and, and, and little by little realizing that every single step along the way there were moments where my culture and my sense of identity was erased. Where teachers, the opposite of Mrs. Me, where teachers were affecting how I perceived myself. So it's a power that we have as educators, it's a power. What you say to a child can affect them, and sometimes they don't even know it's affecting them until later, when they're rewinding, bless you. That will affect this child later. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously. And then I realize something, and then I reckon with my parents, with my family, with my family being at our at our family parties, when look in my culture, you have parties for your cousin, for your second cousin, for your third cousin, for your cousin, when you call cousin, it's not really your cousin. You have parties, right? And here's the thing: every time I start reminding, I start remembering, I start remembering, and every time I remember going to a party and the salsa music would play, and I would just go like this: Nope, I'm not dancing because I hate salsa music. I don't dance on some music. And I remember, I start thinking, I'm like, every time I have family members, ah, what do you mean you don't dance on some music? What kind of a Cuban are you? It didn't dawn on me back then, but it started as I was rewinding everything. I said, wait a minute, look at this. What kind of a Cuban are you, gringo? And then I start thinking about random, arbitrary things, like cafe con leche. I hate cafe con leche. What do you mean you hate cafe con leche? What kind of a Latino are you that doesn't like cafe con leche? And then realizing that I just I had buried it away, I had put it away, not thinking about it, because I didn't, I didn't reckon with what that meant to erase that. And I start thinking and I start processing all of this information and it's happening in an instant. And I'm realizing that I have gone now, by changing my name, I had gone and erased. I had erased my history, I had erased who I was. And I, it took me to rewind, to realize, oh my gosh, what have I done? And look at all the stuff that I had missed. We missed it. I had changed my name. And by changing it, I erased myself. It was like the final straw. It was the final erasure. And here's the thing, we can have kindness like someone like Miss Mead who encourages creativity. And we can have people that are not kind. People that will make little comments. Sometimes they're even in our families. 
I had lost my Spanish. I didn't even realize. I was saying I'm Cuban, but I had lost my Spanish. I had lost my Spanish being in school. I lost it and didn't regain it until much later, until I was well an adult. I was working in kitchens. That's where I learned, relearned my Spanish. I was washing dishes, busting tables, and that's where I relearned my Spanish. It took me being an adult to reckon with the idea that I had lost it. So there's a great power in how we give children, young people, their sense of identity their sense of belonging, their sense of who they are, right? I have lost it. And a lot of people ask me, well, when did you become a writer? Well, I've, you know, I've been creative for a long time. I've been creative for a long time in my life. But when I became a writer, I trace it back to that moment, to that conversation with my mom, to feeling bad and then feeling angry and then feeling like I needed to do something with the way that I perceived myself. Because sometimes, because sometimes we are caught in between identities, right? Maybe we are from somewhere, or maybe we have family that is from one place and we're from another place, and we feel that disconnect. I call it being stuck in the margins. You know, sometimes, I can't tell you how many, how many people I talk to that have Mexican American Mexican families. And they feel ashamed because every time I visit Mexico, I'm made to feel like an outsider. But then they're here and they're made to feel like an outsider too. So where do, you, where do we belong in all of this? Where do we fit? And I started thinking about all of this. And for me, my, my true awakening came at that moment. When I had when I had erased my name, and my mother reminded me that this is the reality. And it made me reckon with my own history and what I had erased for myself. So I embarked on a, on a journey. I embarked on a journey of self-discovery, of, of asking questions, of asking myself tough questions. This idea that Spanish was not a part of my life makes its way into my stories. Maria and her father Sergio come down to sell produce at the farmer's market on the weekends, Dio Hermenio says. Sergio says it's the only time he gets to spend with his daughter anymore. She's leaving in the fall to start school in Florida. He's very emotional about it. Don't bring it up. So the farmer's market is still around? Mom asks. It's even bigger now, Theo Hermenio says. All local products, crecido en Puerto Rico. He raises his hands excitedly and loses his balance a little. He holds on to the stair railing, esta bendita cadera. He rubs his head. I'll get it replaced eventually. Maria steps out of her room. Me voy a resfriar, Maria says shivering. Papi! Ya voy! Yells a voice from the shared bathroom. Dios mío, los teenagers no tienen paciencia para nada. We all look at Theo Hermenio. They love each other, he says, and keeps walking up another flight of stairs. I asked my mom what they were saying. She tells me that Maria was yelling at her dad because she was cold and didn't have hot water to shower. Her dad was yelling that his teenage daughter doesn't have any patience. I don't understand any of it. I write with family, with culture, with community now. Those stories, Spanish, right? The search for identity. The search for language. They make their way into my words now. It didn't just come, though. That moment that I had with my dad, and he was very ashamed, and then I, I had to find myself, and I rewound, and I said, this is, this is what I've been missing, and I need, to, I need to claim that history back. I need to claim my identity. I need to claim who I am. I need to find myself in the margins. That moment did not just pop, and I started writing these books. It did not stop there. I enrolled in a graduate program. And I was excited. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to write with culture. I'm going to write with language. I wrote my master's thesis, my critical thesis, in Spanglish. I was so pumped. I did tell my wife, I'm probably going to get kicked out of this program, but we'll see what happens. 
I won the critical thesis prize. Arguing for using multilingualism in texts for writing for children and young adults. I won the critical thesis prize. Awesome. Oh my God. We are on. We're ready. Let's take this cultural world by storm. One of the uh, graduate program uh, directors said, you know, you don't always have to write in Spanish. You could write something normal. Huh. But by this time, it was too late. It was too late. I was ready. I had my, I had my cultural knives ready to go. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? That is normal to me. No, no, it's my fault. You're fine. You're fine. <laughs> I was ready, but it's still. It, there's still little reminders. There's still little reminders. Right? I will tell you this. I love my father-in-law. My father-in-law. The first year that I was dating, my wife called me Pueblo. <laughs> Hey, Pueblo. <laughs> hey. And for a minute, I was like, I love this girl. I love this girl. I'm going to punch that guy in the face. I'm going to punch that guy in the face. I'm not, but I love this girl. And I look, I'm like, hey, John is, you know, is a me Pueblo. <laughs> Hoping that she would say, but she did. She's like, she's from New England. So she's like, for her, it's like, yeah. We just don't talk about the problems. We just gotta just let them let them sort themselves out. I'm like, oh hell no! I am going to solve this problem right now. You love me? Yes. I love you too. We're gonna get married? Yes. I'm gonna get married to you too. John, my name is Pablo, not Pueblo. Don't call me that again. <laughs> this is in Thanksgiving. Oh, 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 you should have seen my mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it was odd, awesome. but it was good though. I spoke up. I was ready. I was like, "Listen, I love your daughter. Don't call me Pueblo again." <laughs> it was good. I felt good about it. Finding that that energy. But here's the thing: as I came into my own as a creative, as I started writing these books, these books started coming out and making themselves sort of you know, popping onto the scene, as they say, right? Popping onto the scene, oh my God, you're good. Then I, I started thinking, I'm like, no, I'm not done yet. I have to do more. We have to think about this more. We have to think about this differently. And then I started rewinding and I started thinking, you know what? There is a lot of colorism within my own culture even. This idea, this idea that, that blonde, blue-eyed, right, is, is the default. And it happens in my own culture. It happens in my own culture. My daughter was born. My little daughter is two months old. Right? She was born two months ago. I have two other children, 12, 8, and my daughter. One of the things that some family members have said already, oh, finally, a kid with green eyes. She's going to be blonde. My children, dark hair, dark eyes, Skin color like mine. Family members. Oh my gosh. Finally, we're not going to see that. A blondie. Nothing wrong with blondes. I like blondes. My wife's not blonde, but I like blondes. I mean, I'm not like that. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. No, no. no. So, no. so it's, it's interesting, though, right? This colorism. And I started thinking about this. I'm like, what does this mean? Right? What does this mean, within, even within our own cultures, how we separate each other, you know, how we default? And I started talking to my mom, I talked to my mom about this, I'm like, listen, this is, this is part of our like, colonial past, you know, this is our, our connection, to, like you were trying to connect with Spain, with a Eurocentric idea of what beauty is, or what is acceptable, and she's like, I bother, oh, God. <laughs> Oh my God, you, you're going on your cultural horse again. 
She's just cute. I'm like, she is cute, but that is not what, her blue eye, her green eyes and her blonde hair is not what defines her, right? It is not what defines her. But you're, it's a constant struggle, it's a constant fight. We're constantly trying to understand more about ourselves, about our cultures, but we're also, at least I am, I am on this mission. I'm like, listen, this is not, this is not the way that we should view ourselves. This is not, we have to reckon with who we are individually. We have to see who we are. And it is not this blonde, blue-eyed uh, idea of what is, this is the, the default, right? It's an individual experience. Each and, each and every one of us has an individual experience. And I really wanted to talk about that. And I had begun to talk about it more openly. You know? It's really fascinating. I'll tell family members, like, you know, I'm, uh, one of my aunts was like, why do you keep getting called a person of color? <laughs> I'm like, because that's what I am. <laughs> Maya Angelou's a person of color. You're not a person of color. I'm like, no. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Huh. <laughs> so you're a writer of color? Yes! I am a writer of color. They're loud. They're strange. They don't get it. But I don't expect them to get it. But they will be told constantly by me, reminding them. Right? I can't expect them to change their ideas. These are people that came from an island came to this country, right? And they had to assimilate. They had to be as close to what was accepted as the right way, right? They had to assimilate, so they erased a lot of that sort of sense of cultural identity, right? They had to, but not me, not anymore. Not anymore. And it's really, really cool because this book has, this book is um, coming out in August, and it's one of the hardest books I've ever written. And it talks about a lot of things. Specifically, um, it's really about a, a, a father and a daughter and, um, and how they find themselves back together. And dad comes home from, from deployment for the last time and he's a little off. And, and his daughter, Amelia, is trying to communicate with him. And they end up rebuilding a 1916 Shelby together. And that's where they start communicating. And for me, on a personal level, my 12 and a half year old, Amelia in this book is 12 and a half. My 12 and a half, it was, I have no idea what my 12 and a half year old is up to, like in terms of communicating, no idea. Bobby, don't look at me when I'm coming out of the shower. I'm like, I'm not looking at you when I'm coming out of the shower. Just turn around. Okay, all right. Um, can I just ask why you're using my shower though? Because your shower's bigger, Bobby, obviously. Ah. Okay. I'm going to bed now. All right, I love you. Okay, I love you. Bye. All right. Are you going to snuggle me? I'm just sitting here waiting for you to snuggle me, Bobby. Oh, oh, I didn't know that you wanted me to. Obviously, I do. Do you, do you want me to... to to get into the bed and snuggle you, or do you want me to just, no, obviously I want you to get into the bed and snuggle me, what, I want you to stare at me? <laughs> no, no, okay, I'll get in. <laughs> Don't touch me, puppy! <laughs> she puts her leg on me, and her arm, I'm like, no, no, pop, just, just stop, just stop. <laughs> And I was just like, I gotta figure out how do I communicate with this kid, so I just wrote a book about it. <laughs> about rebuilding a car, because I was like, whatever, you know. Uh, but just, so that's like the main thread, but it's also, I also wanted to explore what we were talking about, this colorism within culture. So Amelia's grandmother has red hair, dad has red hair, Amelia has auburn colored hair. Mom, is Afro-Latina. And there is a bit of colorism that is happening within, between mom and abuela. My head 
jerks as the whale pulls. She takes a skinny comb with a long, pointy handle and splits my hair into sections with hair clips that look like chomping alligators. With one section in her hand, she takes the flat iron in the other. She feeds my hair into the iron and climbs down on the strands. Street steam curls out like a dragon exhaling as the iron slides from the top of my head to my tips. Even though she's never burned me, I get nervous when I wear that close to my ears. I don't have my mom's jet black hair, but I have her curls, or waves. My hair swooshes like a rolling tide, but after our whale is done with it, it's as flat as a pancake. Today she straightens my hair out and puts it up in a ponytail. Pa que se quede liso, she says. I guess she's worried that if I don't put my hair up, it will get wavy later. Abuela turns my head toward the window and keeps working. Quédate quieta, muchacha, Abuela says. You're moving around too much. Aurelia, Mom says, popping into the room. Dejala con su pelo rizado. Abuela stops tugging and looks back at Mom. She's going to school with her hair curly and out of control. She won't be able to focus, Abuela says. What? Mom replies, it's ridiculous. Well, what will people think? I'll tell you that she doesn't have anybody to take care of her. Is that what you want? This, that's what this is about, my mom says. It's always about what other people think. It's important for her to put her best foot forward. Abuela says, continuing to brush out my ponytail. And I think her hair is wavy and beautiful. It's her best foot, and I won't let you tell her otherwise. Mom winks while she scrunches her own hair. It's fine, Mom, I finally say. It's not really fine. Abuela's daily hair rituals hurt, and I think my hair is like a lion's mane, and I love lions. But I'm not interested in Abuela and Mom getting into another argument over my hair. Abuela finishes by putting a large blue bow on top of my head. I get up and move toward my mom, who is still standing at the door. She's wearing baggy sweatpants and a tank top and has her favorite fluffy argyle socks on. Her long, curly black hair flows, falls along her shoulders like a waterfall in the dead of night. I look back at my grandmother. She's wearing freshly pressed pants and a blouse with circles and stars on it. Her auburn hair perfectly in place without a loose strand. Her round, rosy chick cheeks and thin lips are staying the color of an Arkansas black apple and she's wearing the same gold and pearl earrings she's worn since my abuelo died. Between my mother and grandmother, I'm a blend of both. Short, head, wavy, auburn hair, eyes large with dark yellow-green colors. I don't have mom's complexion. One that, as she once said, she's a descendant of the Yoruba. Emilia viene de sangre española, abuela replied. She resembles my side of the family. She may have Spanish ancestry, mom said but she also has West African blood coursing through her veins. She needs to know all parts of her heritage, not just the European. When, I would have interrupted. Remember, most of our family came from Spain, and some from Ireland. That's why your hair is that color, Mina. See, but you can't deny the Orishas guide her spiritual journey as well, Mom said. Ay, muchacha, I would have responded, clearly frustrated. She's baptized Catholic. You baptize her Catholic, Mom said. And she whispered to me loudly enough for Abuela to hear, no matter what, nunca dudes lo que está in your mind and spirit, mi amor. That, and sea como sea, our Yoruba heritage teaches us to respect your elders. Mom kissed my forehead. I smiled. Abuela frowned. my cultural identity, the, the more profoundly I claim that, that heritage, the, the freer I feel. I don't apologize for who I am. I don't apologize for not dancing salsa, not liking cafe con leche. I'm proud that I've reclaimed my Spanish, that I've relearned it. I still have a long way to go. I still don't write Spanish well, I struggle reading, but I'm trying, I'm learning. My dad, uh, he's a quiet man, he's still alive, he's 87. He's a quiet guy, he doesn't really, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't really 
give compliments easily. Let's just say that. He tells my mom the other day, he says, you know, Pucho, they call me Pucho. He goes, Pucho, his books are good. My dad says, that's, that's all he says. And my mom says, you should tell him. He goes, pa' que, pa' que se infle la cabeza. <laughs> Why, so his head can explode? He said, like, you should tell him. So my dad calls me into his, into his work office. And I walk in, I hadn't seen his office in a little while. And I walk in, and I'm like, hey. And he's just sitting there, and he's looking. And I turn around, and I see a giant framed uh, poster of my two book covers, The Epic Fail and of Marcus Vega. He hasn't done these things for me. And I look back and I look at him and he goes, what are you doing? The thing that stood out to me in those frames was not the title, the beautiful color is the name. Baba. This idea that I almost erased that. This idea that I get to go around the country claiming that name, not only for myself, but for my grandfather, for my great grandfather, for my dad. And I can see his pride from that journey from that moment that he took my headshot and he said when from the name change to now I gigantic poster obscenely so okay? I'm like take it Bobby it's a little much <laughs> but the name Bob Bob Redaya and that's his his legacy is in, is is represented right and it made me really proud it made me really proud. And when I won the Pura Belpre for the epic fail of Arturo Zamora, bless you again. When I won the, the Pura Belpre, I looked up and the first thing, I was so happy that that was the book that I came on the scene for. I was so happy. Do you know why? Because it was a love letter to my grandparents. And it was a love letter to all grandparents out there who have sacrificed their culture, with, who have, have sacrificed so much of themselves and I looked up and I spoke and I could hardly contain it. And I looked up and I said, Abuelo, Abuelo, that's for you. And it was such a great moment. And it wasn't just my Abuelo, but it was my dad's and my mom's and every single person out there who has an Abuelo or an Abuela who helped shape their culture and their identity even when it was lost. And this kid, who reclaimed it. So I always end with my, when I go visit, I always end with this, um, this great chant. And I always say, all right, now I want you to, I want, I want you all to say this with me, and I want you to get your teachers really nervous. And I've been in a room with a thousand kids, <laughs> and the teachers are like, what is he about to do? <laughs> And I look and I say, all right, I want you to say it with me. And I said, it took me a long time to feel like I could claim my own identity, like I could feel that my voice mattered. And I want to tell you all today, this is what I tell the kids, I said, I want to tell you all today that your voices matter. That you are important, that your voice and your story matters. I want you to say it with me, my voice matters. Right? And then the kids, I'm like, make your teachers really nervous. I go, one, two, three, my voice matters. And my voice matters. I'm like, no, it's not loud enough. Louder. And they go louder. And it's awesome. And I love it. And there could be 75 kids like there was earlier today, or there's 2,000. I did 2,000 kids in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I thought that the let like that that Lambeau Field was gonna be like, that was pretty loud, dude. <laughs> it was awesome. It was great. So I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think, if you have ever felt like your voice has been marginalized, like your voice has been left to the shadows, to the margins, I want you to say, my voice matters. If you have a student, if you have a student or students out there that you feel like they, they, they need to hear from you to say that their voice matters, I want you to say their voice matters. All right? It's your own personal journey. You can do it for your kid, or you can do it for yourself. 
right? But I want you all to say it. Say it like a prayer, say it like a declaration, say it like an affirmation, right? Because we're all here together, we're all in this together. You're on the front lines. You're on the front lines and those children are looking to you. And I, I desperately want more Mrs. Needs out there and I know that there's so many of you that can shape the life of a kid who can help end up finding himself again. All right, so when I count to three, I want you all to say, either my voice matters or their voice matters, all right? Nice and loud. I can't say make your teachers nervous. I don't know. Make, make the, I don't know. I don't know. Make whoever nervous. Who cares? Let's do it. You ready? One, two, three. And 
I said, she's like, you, it, it's, and it was, it's a really interesting representation because I, that's how he, that's how he is, but he hasn't, he's, it's not about that. It's about their friendship and about how he, he's Mexican American and how he comes, you know, how he ends up fighting for his community. Um, and it's not about that. So it's sort of, I just, I just leave it out there, you know, rather than making it, I, I really kind of want to push away from making this the issue book, like, oh, it's a Mexican American gay character. Let's write about, let's make it about that now. I don't want that. I want this to, like, I want you to fall into this world and look at these characters as completely, fully realized human beings. Because I don't, I have friends who, who are, who are gay, and I'm not like, oh, this is my gay friend, John. <laughs> you know, this is my friend, John. You know? And, and so for me, that's, that's really important. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's the, uh, that's Gus. It's the first time I actually say that publicly. All right, cool. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, some other questions? Yes. works for different for everybody. I don't particularly like writers groups, but that does not mean that writers groups aren't good. Let me just be clear about that. Um, I think that I think that finding a story, your story, is a very personal journey. Um, and I think that you need to go on that journey alone before you can share it with others. Because you need to know a lot about that journey. And then once you are prepared to share that, if it's a writer's group, if it's you know a, a graduate program, if it's whatever it is, then that can help you to form the structure of that story. You know, I mean, I was told with Epic Fail, Epic Fail is a deeply personal story. Um, it's not a true story, but it's very personal. And I knew I, how I wanted to say it, and I had um, this is a this is a true behind the book story. Um, this book was originally um, being worked on with uh, one of the uh, editors of Harry Potter, originally. And I was super excited because it's one of the editors of Harry Potter, oh my god, it's going to be amazing, and this and that. And, and, and it was, I, I was giving myself in to her whims more than I was to the actual story, and I felt weird about it. I was like, 
this doesn't feel right. But it's the editor of Harry Potter. And I was like, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. And then eventually, eventually my agent, God bless her, she was like, we're done. We're done here. And pulled, pulled out. And, and then I ended up, it ended up in the hands of a Mexican-American editor, one of the only editors of color in the major publishing houses. And she got it. We spoke for an hour. I hung up the phone. I said, she's the one. She gets it. She knows the story. And that was it. And her and I have published. Now we're working on the third, third we're working on our fourth book together. Right? And now she's a senior editor at this new imprint, and it's super cool. But it's like, you gotta, you gotta feel good about where your story is. Right? Because there will be professionals that will tell you so many different things, but you have to feel good about where your heart is. Does that sort of answer? Yeah. Okay. I know there's a lot we can talk about. We can just, like, everybody just clear out. We're going to speak about this. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'm so surprised. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. I haven't read any of your book, sadly. What? Uh, I was like, I'll probably get into it since, you know, I'm like, I'm like, um, but I was just curious. How do you, uh, personally, like, engage with, like, um, I guess, like, in terms of, like, the, like, when I'm, like, hearing these stories, like, uh, like, some of these men, um, how do you, like, engage with these men encountering, like, with their, like, men? Like they're machismo, you know what I mean? Like with their machismo, that's a great question. I, I have, um, I grew up in a very female dominant um, household. And so one of the great compliments that I've received about my books, okay, and this has come from uh, women of color, especially Latina women, is that they tell me, Bobby, you, it's not that you write women really well, it's that you write men who know how to treat women well. And you're not creating this sort of idea that this little boy, it's like, like this boy, he gets rejected and he just moves on. He's like, okay, I, mean, I gotta deal with it. He doesn't throw fit. He doesn't shame her. He doesn't say like, ah, oh, whatever. He doesn't make her feel bad. He's just like, okay. And he just feels bad, but he walks off. He doesn't insult her. And one of the great compliments I received from that was like, thank you for doing that. Right? Because you're teaching boys to be okay with rejection. But they don't have to go and like slut shame a woman or a girl because she rejected him. And I love that. And I also got one of my dad's, one of my dad's friends. He's 92 years old. He has read both of my books, and he is in now way from pretty tiny spark. It's the cutest thing. He's a former professor of literature at Columbia University. All right? 92 years old, right? And he goes, he was part of the He's he's Cuban, and he's he, he, he taught in the in the um, Latino Studies department. And he goes, Papa, te tengo que decir una cosa. He's very professorial. I have to tell you something. Your books, it's like I see my guests. I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Got to see my guests. He goes, no, 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 I'm going to tell you why. Because you write women so well. You write real women. And it's, they're fully realizing, and it's great to me. They're strong women. Because this is excellent. Excellent, Pablo. Keep it going. He goes, keep it going. <laughs> okay, thank you, Armando. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. I see you, Marquez. <laughs> so, yeah, machismo not, doesn't have any room in my, in my life at all. So, that's whatever comes out of there is, is the product of a lot of, you know, the way that I've just been brought up. You know, and I want to represent boys in a way that shows that, you know, they can be cool with girls. They don't have to be jerks if they get rejected. You know? Yeah. What are some of the strategies that you use to
observing the dynamic and explaining it? Yeah. What are other strategies that you use so that everyone sees something like that? Um, it's really mostly in context clues. You know, I, I, uh, a lot of, a lot of the work that I do is, is try to make the, if there's Spanish being woven in, is to try to make it feel as natural as possible, as if it would be said in, in a real conversation. So in a lot of my culture, like, you break into Spanish quickly, right? But you're not obviously translating. You know, if I go, mami, como estas? My mom's not going to turn to me. So you said, how am I? <laughs> you know, it's going to be like, no, I'm fine. What's going on? You know, and it's just, and I try to create, I, tr I try it very, that, that's, I try with a lot of um, precision and care to to write the Spanish naturally, and then and then come up with a context clue to help the reader understand what the what they're saying. It's really that's that's the tool. Things that I avoid are like obvious translations, falling to stereotypes, you know, things like that that are you know that are kind of markers for me. That that take away from the natural way that a bilingual speaks. And sometimes we code switch with you know all the time. We code switch within one paragraph. We get code switch ten times. You know, and so I want to keep it as natural as possible. Nice, good question. I can tell you all the teachers, <laughs> educators. There's some speech pathologists in here too, right? Did I hear that? Oh, oh, specialized department, yeah. So special ed? Special ed. I see you guys. Special ed? My mom is special ed. Being there tomorrow. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, thank you so much for answering questions. Yeah. Uh, before we get a round of applause, I just want to give you two little informational items. So, right outside King's English is uh, selling both um, Abbe Fidel uh, and also Marcus Vega. So, feel free to line up and purchase for both, or if you brought your own copy. Um, you'll be allowed to sign those. So I will, yes, I will sign. Yeah. So we'll be happy to be able to sign. So go ahead and take some time to do that if you can today. If you want to walk by and look at the book sets, please do so. Remember that they're available for lending now for three week period. Um, if you would like a chance to win an advanced reading copy of A Tiny Spark, then you need to email um, the readview at utah.edu, including your name and your address. Um, and we'll pull 20 names out of what we get from email and make sure those books get to you. So cross your fingers, there's 100 people in here, so you have a pretty good chance, but maybe not. Uh, so All right, let's do it one more time. Let's do it one more time. One more time, one more time. All right? My voice or their voice matters. Ready? Okay? Feel it inside. You were like, <laughs> One, two, 